Hello everyone and I would like to welcome you to what to expect when you're expecting a volcanic eruption. May is Volcanic Awareness Month in Washington, so we're excited to have you all here to learn about our volcanic hazards and what you can do about them. Um, so we have a great team here today from a number of different organizations that all work to help monitor our volcanoes, uh, prepare for them, mitigate the hazards, and uh, make sure that you're able to find out in the most interactive way possible what the hazards are in your area. Um, so thank you for coming. This is a huge step towards being more prepared and we hope we can answer some of your questions. Um, when it comes to questions in this Teams event, um, near the meeting chat where that would normally be, there is a Q&A section. Um, you can send questions in there. Uh, we will answer them at the end as we have time. Um, we will type some answers out as well. So hope to get to all of those as much as possible. Feel free to put them in there. Um, otherwise, I would like to introduce our first speaker to get this ball rolling. Um, so our first will be uh, John Ewart from the USGS, uh, US Geological Survey Cascades Volcano Observatory. I, my name is John Ewart. I'm at the US Geological Survey at the Cascades Volcano Observatory, and uh, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of our active volcanoes in the Washington Cascades. Slides, please. OK. Um, our volcanoes, the icons uh, of the Western landscape, we love them. They're centerpieces of our national parks, our wilderness areas, national monuments. We have all of these in, in, uh, in Washington state. They are integral parts of our Northwest identity. Um, you know, we, we put volcanoes on our license plates, then they're recreation and tourism destinations. Slide please. And there are also active volcanic systems that threaten people and infrastructure downslope, downstream, and downwind. Slide, please. And it's the, the downslope, downstream, and downwind that we're going to be um, paying attention to in this brief presentation. Slide, please. So the Cascade volcanoes um, are all basically active. They're not erupting at the present time, but they are active functioning volcanic systems. Um, the Cascade range volcanoes have long lives, um, uh, several hundred thousand to half a million years each. Um, and on average, we can expect to have two multi-year long eruptions per century. So for instance, in the previous century, in the 20th century, we had eruptions at um, uh, Lassen uh, Peak in Northern California Cascades and at Mount St. Helens and together um, we had about 10 years of eruptive activity in the 20th century. So about 10% of the time um, on sort of a, a century basis we can expect to have volcanic activity. Just want to point out that um, the probability of a large eruption in the Cascades, uh, the probabilities dominated by Mount St. Helens uh, eruptive history, um, is that we would have, that we're about four times as likely to have uh, an important eruption in the Cascades as we are to have uh, a Cascadia uh, subduction zone earthquake in any given year. So um, obviously the consequences won't be as great with a volcanic eruption, uh, but nevertheless significant events. Slide please. So in 2005 and 2018, we did a national volcanic threat assessment where we looked at uh, the, the eruption histories of the volcanoes, and then we looked at what, uh, what kinds of hazards the volcanoes are capable of projecting on an individual basis. And then we looked at what was around uh, those volcanoes with, within their reach. So looking at population and infrastructure, and we came up with a threat level uh, category, categorization, and I want to draw your attention to the red triangles on the west coast of the US. These are the volcanoes that are the very highest threat uh, in the US. In the US we've got about 161 active volcanoes and the majority of the highest threat volcanoes are here on the west coast where uh, we have lots of people and infrastructure nearby. So the ca these cascade volcanoes are a high threat because they can project their hazards far downwind as ashfall and downstream as lahars to populated and developed areas. And uh, we're going to talk now about uh, the lahars and ashfall and what that means. Those are the, the principal hazards that we need to consider here in the Pacific Northwest. Slide please. 
So lahars. Um, a lahar, uh, lahar is an Indonesian word that the scientific community has uh, adopted for debris flows or mud flows that come from uh, volcanoes. In the Pacific Northwest, they are commonly generated by swift melting of snow and ice during, um, during an, an explosive volcanic eruption. But we can also make uh, these flows by uh, wet landslides, by rapid emptying of crater lakes or debris dammed lakes. We can mobilize uh, sediment or recent uh, ash fall by intense rain. And important, importantly, uh, you know, these things basically destroy or bury everything in their past. And in the upper left image, we have a photo of a lahar deposit from 1982. Below that is uh, in the North Fork, or in, I'm sorry, in the Main Fork Tootle River, um, uh, showing what happened when a lahar from Mount St. Helens passed and, and took out uh, the bridge there. You can still see the abutments. And then, um, most famously, perhaps uh, in 1985, an eruption at Nevada del Ruiz uh, produced a lahar, which resulted in 25,000 casualties. And we're looking at the site of the city of Armero, where uh, 20,000 of those casualties occurred. So um, these are uh, impressive events when they occur. Slide, please. So we have some recent experience with Lahar-like events here in Washington. In 2014, we had the SR530 uh, landslide, also known as the Oso landslide, uh, which occurred. You can see the scarp in the upper right part of the photo. This is where some glacial deposits, which were uh, completely saturated with water, uh, slid off the uh, north uh, valley wall of the North Fork Stillaguamish and raced across the valley. The avalanche quickly converted into a, into a debris flow. It crossed the, uh, the river valley at about 50 miles an hour. And although it was uh, fairly small uh, by, the, by kind of the standard of, of Lahars, it's, it covered about a half square mile, destroyed 40 houses and cost 43 lives. And I just want you to imagine the, the scope of an event like that were it to uh, come off of a volcano and uh, affect an entire uh, river drainage. So slide please. <clears throat> Moving on to ash hazards. Uh, volcanic ash is produced when an explosive eruption lofts uh, vast quantities of broken lava essentially into the atmosphere and when it comes back down to uh, to land on on earth it loads structures it reduces visibility sometimes to zero can basically turn night into day um, the material is abrasive and conductive there are health risks associated with that and it can impact large areas and have a long duration um, and it's an acute hazard to aircraft uh, the image at the uh, upper right is the uh, power plant at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, uh, which had collapsed owing to ash fall from Pinatubo 1991. Lower left is a DC-10 at the nearby uh, Subic Bay, QB Point area, also in the Philippines, uh, plane covered with ash and sitting on its tail. And then on the lower right is an image of uh, the ash cloud from Mount Spur in Alaska in 1982 as it made its way across all of North America over the course of about three days, um, impacting aviation as it, uh, as it proceeds. Slide, please. So what is this stuff, volcanic ash? It's, it's volcanic rock, it's glass and mineral fragments, uh, all less than two millimeters in diameter. You can see a photomicrograph of a piece of ash on, on the right. Note that it's uh, it's basically a frothy sort of bubble walls, but that's that's glass. It's uh, very sharp when it's fresh and it has the hardness of about a pocket knife. And uh, a lot of the material that that will fall is smaller than 10 microns in diameter. And this is important because that's about the, the size uh, below which we can inhale it and it will actually get into our lungs and, and can cause some, some pretty severe problems for, um, for people, particularly if you're uh, prone to uh, a condition such as asthma. Um, it's also kind of uncomfortable when it lands on you. That's because it's uh, uh, adsorbed a lot of acids, hydrochloric, hydrofluoric, sulfuric acid. So it's, 
it's not a pleasant thing to to be in an ash fall. Slide please. Um, also good to know that um, a distant volcano, not the one in your backyard, may be the one that affects you the most. Um, if you live in the Seattle area, you could receive volcanic ash from Glacier Peak, from Mount Rainier, from Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, even from as far away as uh, Three Sisters or Crater Lake. Uh, we know that because, well, we've found ash from Crater Lake um, all up and down well, Washington um, on our on our Washington volcanoes, for instance. So um, important to know uh, when you know when you hear about a Cascade volcano um, in a state of, of activity and potentially uh, threatening to erupt, uh, you know where you are with respect to the volcano, how far and, and which way the wind's blowing on on any given day. Um, in Washington, we, we do have the uh, the main ash producers in the Cascades at Mount St. Helens and Glacier Peak. Slide, please. So uh, now we're going to uh, step into looking at our individual Washington volcanoes. This is just a map of the state that shows um, that most of our volcanoes are on protected lands. They're in national parks like Mount Rainier or national monuments, Mount St. Helens, and uh, the rest in wilderness areas. So um, these are um, their protected lands. They're the places that we go to, to recreate um, with these volcanoes. And slide, please. But important to know, as you look at the map on the left, that the hazard footprint of these volcanoes is quite large and extends far beyond where the volcano is located. Um, you saw the, uh, the potential for, for ash mainly going to the, the east of the volcanoes in, in previous slide. And here I want to call your attention to the, uh, the blue areas that, that uh, come down from the volcanoes. These are the Lahar hazard zones, and you can see that uh, Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, and Mount Rainier all uh, have the capability of sending Lahars all the way to Puget Sound, while Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and Mount Hood in Northern Oregon um, send their Lahars to the Columbia River area. So um, we're able to project that hazard in the form of, uh, of Lahars quite long distances. Um, you know, 50, 80, 100 miles in cases. So um, important to know that uh, you don't have to be right next to a volcano to uh, potentially have an issue with it. Slide, please. So starting in the north with Mount Baker, um, we, we know that Mount Baker is active. It produces steam plumes that are often visible. Uh, in winter, the Sherman Crater area on the southeast side of the volcano is the, the uh, currently active uh, feature there. It has been the source of eruptions throughout the Holocene uh, epoch, which is the last 11,000 and 11 and a half thousand years, more or less. Um, and in 1975, we had an intrusion of uh, live magma uh, far beneath the volcano, which added enough heat and gas to the system that uh, there was a lot of melting that took place in Sherman Crater and some pretty substantial steam plumes uh, that were uh, coming off the volcano in 1975. And it uh, it looked like it was getting ready to erupt, but it, it did not in that case. Slide, please. So here's the, the hazard map for uh, for Mount Baker. Uh, Lahars are the principal hazard from Mount, from, uh, Mount Baker. Um, and some flank collapses have accompanied uh, eruptions there. Uh, Mount Baker is not a highly explosive volcano. It's more like Mount Rainier and Mount Adams in that it's dominantly built of just andesite uh, lava flows. So um, not a big not a big ash producer, but uh, because it, it has so much ice on it, uh, so many active glaciers that there's uh, lots of water available to be uh, to help generate lahars. Slide please. Moving uh, south to Glacier Peak. Glacier Peak is the most uh, remote volcano in Washington. Uh, it's also the second most explosive volcano in the Cascade Range after Mount St. Helens and large ash falls have, have occurred there in the past. 
And like Mount St. Helens, uh, this volcano is constructed of, of lava domes. Um, lava domes are just uh, lava which is so viscous and pasty and thick that it doesn't want to flow. So it, it just builds up on top of the vent, forming a dome-like structure. You can see, looking at the, uh, the graphic on the lower left, um, kind of a timeline of eruptions. Uh, Glacier Peak has been quite uh, frequently active. Uh, the most recent activity about 350 years ago. Slide please. So here's the hazard map for uh, for Glacier Peak. Um, uh, Lahars from this uh, flow down uh, the west down the Seattle White Chuck Sock drainages towards uh, towards Darrington. Um, in the past, flows have gone down the North Fork, uh, Stilaguamish, um, and more recently just down the Sauk into the Skagit. Um, just wanted to point out, and Wes will probably address this in his talk, uh, there's one seismic station near the summit, about three miles away, and the next station is another 20 miles away. So it is um, the third most active volcano in the Cascades, the second most explosive, and it's um, the monitoring there is not so good, but the USGS and the Cascades, uh, the Cascades Volcano Observatory is working with the Forest Service to permit four more seismic and GPS stations at that volcano, which um, will give us uh, as early a warning as possible when that system decides to reawaken. Slide, please. So moving south, Mount Rainier, uh, if we look in the, uh, the, the graphic in the lower right, we're looking at the last about 3,000 years of history, and we can see those red dots, each of those is, is an eruptive period. The volcano was very busy from about 2,100 to about 2,600 years ago, more eruptive activity 1,500 years ago. The last or the most recent magmatic eruption was 1,000 years ago, but um, uh, I want to point out that 500 years ago, we had the electron mud flow occur, we, we, and we don't find any evidence for an eruption that, uh, that accompanied that, that flow. Um, this came from the Sunset Amphitheater. There was uh, a debris avalanche up there, which uh, being water saturated, it, it uh, quickly turned into a lahar, flowed down the Puyallup River Valley um, as far as uh, and just a little beyond Sumner. Um, so uh, that's uh, Mount Rainier, uh, the second most active volcano in all of the Cascades. Slide, please. So uh, here's the, uh, the simplified hazard map for Mount Rainier. And uh, again, like Mount Baker and Adams, just want to point out that it's constructed mainly of lava flows. Um, the snow and ice on our Cascade volcanoes um, is in addition to making the volcanoes look really nice, it, it also promotes acid alteration, which weakens the volcanic structure. Now it does this because the, the hot magma uh, at depth below the volcano is releasing heat and acid gases, and this can mix with the water, which is there as a, you know, constantly sourced by the glacier. And the acid that, uh, that, that, uh, um, develops in that in that water uh, eventually will change the rock from uh, from rock into clay and clay is not so strong um, and this is why some of our volcanoes are prone to falling apart particularly when they um, are erupting so uh, just a, a interesting factoid is that there's about a cubic mile I'll say that again a cubic mile of ice mantling mount rainier um, that's a lot of water, and that means that even a small eruption could have some devastating consequences um, caused by lahars. Slide, please. Okay, moving south to Mount St. Helens. I hope most folks on the call um, have at least some passing familiarity with Mount St. Helens. We have an important anniversary coming up on Tuesday with the 41st anniversary of the May 18th eruption. Um, just a, a before and after picture and some uh, facts about that uh, eruption. You know, half a cubic mile of debris avalanche uh, uh, half a cubic mile of the volcano now fills the North Fork uh, Tootle. 
Um, about 200 square miles of forest were, were leveled in the, uh, in the explosive onset of that eruption. Um, there were 57 fatalities and uh, about a billion dollars of losses in 1980 dollars. I don't know what that is in 2021 dollars, but substantially more, I'm sure. Um, if you have never visited Mount St. Helens, I'll just put a plug in here that, uh, you know, come on down or come on up I-5 to Castle Rock and go up Highway 4, uh, 504, sorry, and visit the Johnston Ridge uh, Observatory uh, Visitor Center run by the Forest Service. Uh, it is right in the middle of the devastated area and there's lots to see and learn about the eruption there. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to spend a day. Um, but check the weather before you go. Slide please. So uh, Mount St. Helens eruptive history. Mount St. Helens is the most active volcano in the Cascades and has been for about the last 3,900 years. I want to draw your attention to the red print, which shows us the, the times when Mount St. Helens has been dormant. And although it's the most act, active volcano right now, um, important to know that <clears throat> in the 7,000 years preceding uh, when it turned on again in uh, 3,900 years ago, um, it was completely quiet. We have no evidence of eruptive activity for about 7,000 years before the volcano switched on 3,900 years ago and has been erupting pretty frequently and uh, with some very powerful eruptions ever since. So, and that's this uh, history demonstrates pretty much what we, uh, how most of the Cascade volcanoes uh, behave. They're long, long periods of quiet separated by shorter uh, intense periods of, of eruptive activity. Slide please. So here's the, the hazard map for Mount St. Helens. Um, I want to call your attention to the tan colored area on the right, which is the regional basaltic lava flow hazard zone. We'll see uh, more of that when we move on to Mount Adams next, but uh, and we'll and we'll talk about some of the volcanoes that are in that, but uh, I think it's important to understand that in addition to the, the really, you know, photogenic, iconic, snow covered, uh, charismatic stratovolcanoes that we have in Washington, that we have a lot of other little volcanoes that uh, have popped up in the past and, and will probably pop up again in the areas between the stratocones. Slide please. John, while you're on this slide, could you really quickly explain the, the color code on this uh, hazard map? Yeah, so the uh, the pink area right around Mount St. Helens is uh, what we call the proximal or near near in hazard zone, and um, this is where multiple hazards could uh, be an issue. And this is the same on all these uh, simplified hazard maps that I've been showing. The the proximal hazard zone is where um, things like lahars and avalanches and pyroclastic density currents and um, ballistic bomb fall can can occur out of out of the volcano. So it, it's a, a zone where um, multiple things can happen very quickly. Um, the other, uh, the red going to yellow um, coming down the uh, the drainages is are the lahar lahar hazard zones, um, and you'll see that with St. Helens right where you had the cursor there, that's about where the sediment retention structure is on, on the Toodle River, which um, would trap most uh, lahars coming down at this point. Um, so, so let's move on to Mount Adams. Next slide. This is Mount Adams. Adams um, hasn't been active a lot lately. Uh, past thousand years or so, which is nothing for a uh, geologic time or a geologist. Um, but in the past about 7,000 years, there have been six lava flows that have been erupted. And a couple of these have flowed six miles or more uh, from the upper flanks of the volcano. And again, like Mount Baker and Mount Rainier, uh, Mount Adams um, is mostly a lava flow producer. It's, it's not explosive. So Adams, Rainier and, and Baker are kind of similar in that regard. Uh, Mount St. Helens and Glacier Peak are similar in that they tend to be more explosive. Um, but again, 
Uh, Mount Adams is covered with an awful lot of permanent snow and ice, and there are large altered areas in the core of the volcano that are prone to failure. And so lahar hazards are the main <clears throat> issue that we have at Mount Adams. Slide please. And here is the uh, simplified hazard map. Uh, again, that pink area close in being the uh, uh, the proximal hazard zone where, where lots of different things can uh, happen very quickly. And then you see the lahar hazards coming off of the drainages, the Klickitat on the right, the white salmon in the middle of the Lewis River um, on the west and the Cispus on the, on the northwest. All of these can and do host uh, lahars. Uh, most recently, most frequently, they've, uh, they've, this has been an issue in the uh, white salmon uh, drainage. So, and again, that tan area that, that I pointed out in the St. Helens map, you can see it's quite a bit bigger here around uh, Mount Adams. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see what that's about. So this is a map. Uh, we have Mount Hood on the south, Rainier in the north, St. Helens on the west, and Adams um, sort of in the center east part there. And all those black dots are, are places where uh, a little basaltic volcano has erupted in the past few hundred thousand to maybe a million years or so. Um, and so this, this big area between uh, Mount Adams and, and St. Helens and actually between Rainier and Hood and, and extending down into central Oregon beyond of uh, the Three Sisters Bend area um, has all these little basaltic volcanoes that kind of pop up. Now in Washington, we have the Indian Heaven area, which is shown there in the green shading, and the West Crater Volcanic Field, which is which is circled. Uh, these are, are areas in, in uh, here that, that have had recent uh, eruptions, and uh, some of them uh, fairly large. Uh, slide, please. So when I mean large, I mean they've they've erupted a lot of basalt uh, lava. So this is a, a view of the Indian Heaven volcanic field from um, from the Mount Adams area. And there's about 50 little volcanoes that make up the Indian Heaven volcanic field. The most recent eruption was from the big lava bed flow about 9000 years ago. Um, and that was that's like a quarter cubic mile of of lava that that came up out of the ground and and flowed. Um, if the vents uh, open up and they're close enough to to the Columbia River and they erupt enough volume, um, they have in the past sent lava flows all the way down to the river. And so that's uh, that's a potential issue um, in this in this broad area. Um, so next and final slide. So just to sum up, um, our Cascade volcano hazard footprints are large and in a big eruption, the impacts can be extreme. And we see that uh, very clearly at Mount St. Helens. We have a lot of the very highest threat volcanoes in the United States in the Cascades and, and Washington has um, four of those very high threat volcanoes. So, um, and again, they are uh, we consider them very high threat because they can project their hazards far downwind and downstream into heavily populated and highly developed areas. But I think it's also important to remember that the next eruption in the Cascades may be may be one from may be from one of the high charismatic stratocones, but it's maybe just as likely to be from one of the small uh, volcanic fields that occur throughout the Cascade Range. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Wes Thieland, who is going to give us a rundown on volcano monitoring in Washington. All right. Well, thank you, John, for a great presentation. And I am uh, very excited because John set up several of my slides uh, really great in, in a really great way so that I can take the next 10 minutes and tell you all about volcano monitoring and how we do volcano monitoring in Washington. So uh, my name is Wes Thielen. I am a seismologist at the Cascades Volcano Observatory. I'm only gonna be talking to you for about 10 minutes today. I can talk for days about this. So if you have any questions and I don't get to them at the end of the, the Q&A, feel free to use that email, shoot me some questions and I'll try to get back to you uh, with some uh, uh, answers to those. So. Volcano monitoring in Washington. Next slide, please. Who? Who does it? Well, 
As the USGS Cascades Volcano Observatory, we have the primary responsibility for assessing the volcanic hazards, but we're a team player. We need all these other organizations because of all the different things that we're trying to keep a pulse on and all the places that we're trying to put these stations. So we are working together with the, for instance, the PNSN, that is the uh, group that monitors the regional seismicity. We're working with Pierce County on hazards. Uh, we're working with the National Weather Service. We're working with land managers like the Forest Service and the National Park Service when it comes to permitting. And so we're, we're really working with a lot of different groups to get the, the instruments in the right spots, but also to get the right data sets so that we can understand what it is that we, that's going on at those volcanoes. Next slide, please. What do we monitor? Well, we monitor all the hazards. And so this is a, uh, a schematic plot of a volcano and all the different hazards that uh, could happen. And, and John did a great job of, of going over each of these volcanoes and, and how some volcanoes have certain hazards and, and, and some have different hazards than others. And really, we're interested in all of these. And so that may be landslides or lahars, it may be ashfall and trying to figure out where, once the ash is in the air, where it's going. It might be pyroclastic flows, it might be lava flows. Uh, in Hawaii, uh, we have the issue of volcanic fog, uh, or what we call VOG, um, in some basaltic situations, like what John was talking about. We may see that around here as well. And so, um, essentially, anything that the volcano can throw at us is something that we're trying to monitor. Next slide. So, and I love that John already brought this slide up. We monitor all the Washington volcanoes and John already showed you the map on the right here. All those little dots, they're all little volcanic centers and there's a lot of them. And even though any one center isn't all that likely, taken together, we need to consider things that are not just happening on the strato volcanoes, but also in the areas between them. And so I've included on the right the map that John just showed of southern uh, uh, Washington. And even on the left here, where I show Baker and Glacier, there are even vents, although far uh, uh, less numerous, there are vents that, that are off the volcano that we need to consider when we're talking about or thinking about the um, monitoring those those centers in those areas. Next slide. You know, why do we need to, you know, why are we interested in monitoring these volcanoes? Why don't we just wait till something pops at the top and and monitor what's happening at the top? Well, you know, we are we are not close to forecasting earthquakes. But luckily, we can use earthquakes and other things to forecast volcanic eruptions. When magma moves through the crust, it's got to it, it's it's got to generate some space, and and when it does that, it's pushing out and it's doing things to the 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 ground around it. It might be stressing that, creating earthquakes. It might be pushing on it and creating uh, um, inflation or. Or, or some other type of phenomenon, you know, maybe degassing. And so we can put instruments on the volcano and we can start to track some of these subtle signs of magma movement that you probably couldn't even feel if you were on the volcano. And one great example of this is on the right here, we can see a uh, uh, seismic record of earthquakes during the 2004 Mount St. Helens eruption. And at the top, at September 27th, 2004, it was pretty quiet. And you can see each of those little blips on there, each of those little uh, blue or, or dark blue uh, little um, lines in there is an earthquake. And as things move toward an eruption, in this case, it was a very clear uh, progression from pretty low levels of activity to very strong earthquakes that led up to the October 1st explosion. And Brian, if you can hit this video, I'll show you what that uh, first explosion looked like there. 
we just happen to have a, a helicopter in the air and you can see that material was spewing out and in this case now an eruption has started it's important to know how big this eruption is and once we kind of get bounds on maybe what that eruption and how big it might be and what the hazards might be from that eruption then we can talk about what communities might be impacted and interact with the local emergency officials to give them a heads up on what to expect and let them do what they do best which is take that message to their communities and react appropriately wait for that video to go and then we can go to the next slide Perfect, let's go. So how do we monitor these volcanoes? You know, we use lots of different types of monitoring equipment and we're opportunists here, right? We use whatever we can get our hands on. And so, you know, we use a lot of seismometers. We use a lot of uh satellite data so sometimes you know basically using gps or gnss as it's called now uh is basically recording signals from satellites to figure out whether or not it moved one direction or another and given a network of of equipment we might be able to see if there's a pattern in the way that those gps uh instruments moved in or out and that gives us some sense of what's going on we can use, uh, you know, we can track gas either through airborne uh, uh, measurements, like basically out of a plane or tying something to a uh, helicopter skid. We can do it from the ground, where we might uh, use a spectrometer to look at a plume and figure out how the light is being impacted as it goes through that plume that can give us some sense of what gases are present in that plume and, and at what quantity those uh, gases are there. We use thermal imaging, I mean, just a thermal camera. We use regular cameras. We use tilt meters, anything we can get our hands on, we wanna use here. Because if you can think of each of these disciplines like a different sense, we do a better job of understanding what's happening in the volcano and can give a better forecast or assessment of what's going on when we have lots of different uh, things looking at it. So for instance, when I'm eating food, if I can't smell that, the, the, my experience with tasting that food is going to be different. And in the same way at a volcano, if I can only see the seismic data, I might be missing something that's going on with the volcano. There may be something else that, that the seismicity isn't telling me that I can use some of these other data sets, be it GPS or gas cameras, to figure out what's going on in that volcano. Next slide, please. Well, you know, to extend this how many, uh, or to extend this, this ex, uh, conversation to how many we need, you know, we need a lot of stations. Why? You know, we can think about a, a, a crime scene analogy. And, you know, when you think of, of a bunch of witnesses sort of witnessing the same event, then you might recognize that each one has sort of a different view. They might bring, you know, their experiences to what they see, or they may not actually see anything because they're behind a corner, but hear something. And in the same way, Instruments placed at different parts of the volcano, whether it's close or far away, or maybe in certain sectors, may not be able to see the same thing. So we need lots of stations so that we can see lot, so that we can get lots of observations on that thing that's happening within the volcano or above the volcano. And so thinking about these instruments like witnesses is a good way to think about it. I mean, some of these, sometimes an instrument goes goes uh, um, sideways and is giving you these, these weird observations. It's important to have more than one or have them in different areas so that you can sort of confirm that, oh yeah, that's not actually recording something that is, is real. It's something malfunctioning with the instrument. Next slide, please. 
So as an example, I'll just give you this, this image to look at from Mount St. Helens. This is the best monitoring network in the Cascades currently. And so what I'm showing here is a view from Johnson Ridge Observatory from the north, looking right into the, the lava dome there. And I've put arrows, black arrows, at each of the spots where there's a monitoring station. And the, the dotted arrows are ones that are very close to what you can see, but maybe just over the ridge a little bit. So as you can see, we have at Mount, Mount St. Helens, we have a lot of stations up there. Now, what do these things look like in the field? At the left here is a, is a GPS station. You can see we have a little tripod there with a, a solar panel. That solar panel powers batteries in the case there. And that antenna at the top, that semicircular thing, is the antenna that brings in the satellite information and tells us whether or not that area is moving one way or another. Uh, in the middle image here is a gas sniffing station. It's actually called Sniff. It's on the new dome. You can see the gas right behind it in the solar panels. And then to the right is a station that is a uh, seismic station taken just a couple of weeks ago from the uh, west side of Mount St. Helens. You can see the solar panels and the antenna on top. The, the seismometer is buried in the ground underneath all that snow. So these are sort of three examples of what they look like. These aren't very big structures. You know, from Johnson Ridge, you can't see these. And even with a pretty high powered telescope, you still have a pretty hard time seeing these things. Next question, or sorry, next uh, slide. So as John mentioned, there's disparities among the different volcanoes in terms of how they are currently monitored. And there's a lot of things that go into that. Some of it is access. Some of these, some of these volcanoes, especially somewhere like Glacier Peak, is really, really remote. And it is really hard to get into. And it is really hard to get real-time signals out of. And so that really drives the reason why there's uh, a fairly low number of stations at, at Glacier Peak. Right now, uh, we have big, big plans for future expansions of equipment in the uh, Washington Cascades. So for instance, at Mount Baker, we're planning six new stations, could be eight, could be four. This will be around 2023. Right now, we're, we're scouting sites, we're working on permits. That's, there's lots of, of things that are in the air with that, but we're thinking around six new stations uh, in 2023. In Glacier Peak, we are in the permit process. Uh, there is a public comment period coming up uh, on the Glacier Peak permit that uh, where we would like to put four new stations in, in uh, the summer of 2022, that there would also be one station upgrade in there, so a total of five stations. At Mount Rainier, we've got a big project that we've been working on for a couple of years now about uh, to set up a dual heart detection system around Mount Rainier. And this includes up to 20 new stations by uh, 2022. And there's another public comment period that's coming up this month. So keep your eyes open uh, around the permit that is going, uh, that we're working with the National Park on to permit uh, between nine and 12 of those 20 stations. At Mount Adams, we're working on four new stations sometime between 2022 or 2023. And at Mount St. Helens, uh, these station upgrades are ongoing. And so with that, that is my last slide and I will turn it over to our next presenter. Thank you for your attention and time. Wonderful, thank you, Wes. All right, my name is Karina Allen. I'm the Chief Hazards Geologist at the Washington Geological Survey. And I'm going to share with you today some resources about how you can understand what do these volcano hazards mean to you, how do you prepare for them, and how do you learn about them, and share with you some of the great resources we have at the Washington Geological Survey. So as Wes and John have shared with you, there are five major active volcanoes in Washington shown here on this map. And from north to south, those are Mount Baker, Glacier Peak, Mount Rainier, Mount Adams, and you'll notice this one is missing its top. This is Mount St. Helens. Um, and so part of my presentation today really is going to be just sharing some of the beautiful imagery that we have and are able to um, 
use because of a process called LIDAR. Um, and so the Washington Geological Survey has an excellent website called that you can go to dnr.wa.gov slash volcano and each of these icons has tons of information about the Washington volcanoes, volcanic hazards, evacuation and preparation, hazard maps, um, preparedness products and some fun volcano activities. As part of the Volcano Awareness Month, um, we just put out this interactive web guide for middle schoolers, um, so you can use this gu web guide to tour our website and have your middle schoolers answer different questions and really get to understand volcanic hazards. We also have cool art and preparedness products. Um, a few years ago for Volcano Awareness Month, we made um, volcano preparedness posters for all of the Washington volcanoes, and these have information about when they last erupted, what you need to know about them, and some tips for becoming volcano ready. We also work closely with the United States Geological Survey in putting out volcano ready um, displays at some of the vistas and look out surrounding these volcanoes. An example um, for Mount Rainier is on the bottom right here. And one of our recent publications is a brochure detailing some of the, the need to know information for what the geology of these volcanoes is and preparedness facts for volcanic hazards. So the link is on the bottom of this slide here, but you can also just search volcanic hazard brochure Washington State and it should be the first thing that comes up. We also came out with an activity book. Um, so if you're going to visit Mount St. Helens, this is a great activity book. It highlights different landslides around Mount St. Helens and famously the largest landslide ever when Mount St. Helens erupted and created um, Cold Water Lake and Damned Spirit Lake and created this large um, debris flow. And so on the left is a picture of Mount St. Helens before and on the right is an, a LIDAR image showing where the top went and how it traveled down the valley. There's great graphics that show the, the sequence of events for the Mount St. Helens eruption. And now, um, oh, this got a little messed up, but oh well, I'm gonna transition to a new project that we just came out with called the Washington 100. Um, this is a project that is geotourism based and it highlights 100 excellent sites to see in Washington um, and it highlights the geology of those sites. And so if you again search Washington 100 or go to dnr.wa.gov, um, we have a site that's dedicated to these site, um, the Washington geolo geology sites. And so we've broken it up into different provinces and each of these excellent posters you see here has tons of information about each of these different provinces. So for example, um, the image on the left, upper left here is the um, South Cascades province and each of those little icons you can click on and find out about the geology of those sites, different hikes, things to do and see at those locations um, and just excellent photos and drone footage and you name it, we've got great information and just stunning virtual images. Um, at these locations. So we really encourage you to check that out and go explore Washington and learn about the geology there. I mentioned earlier that um, I'm going to be sharing some LIDAR images with you. For those that aren't familiar with LIDAR, LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging. And so an airplane flies over different um, parts of the state and sends lasers out of um, this fancy machine at the bottom of the plane and the time it takes for the laser to hit the ground and return tells us about the elevation of the ground surface and we're able to visualize things with trees as you can kind of see on the bottom left here this lidar point cloud image shows beacon rock um, which is a large rock along the columbia river and all of the trees surrounding it and then we're able to also take those different laser beam returns and strip off the trees and see what the ground surface looks like without trees on it which is incredibly valuable for understanding the geology and geologic processes in Washington. And this technology has really just made leaps and bounds of difference in how we understand the elevation and um, the surface really of Washington. And so 
On the left, you can see on the furthest back image is what the digital elevation models or topography used to look like about 10 years ago. And as this um, process has evolved and we continue to get better data, we can just get a clearer and clearer picture of what the ground looks like um, in what's called a hill shade model, this foremost image um, in Washington state. And so this is, I'm going to show you some great images that we've come up with to really understand volcanic processes and some of the volcanic wonders in Washington. And so um, in Mount St. Helens, uh, I think John mentioned that there is a dome building event um, after the 1980 eruption in 2002 to 2010. Um, there was a dome that grew inside of Mount St. Helens and then the glaciers, um, once the dome building sort of ceased or quieted down, you can see here in 2009 that the glaciers um, came and filled in that valley. And so this is a sequence of LIDAR images that show how that volcanic dome built and then how the glaciers grew. Um, this is an image of Mount Adams and a lava flow, a recent lava flow from Mount Adams. And this is what an aerial image looks like. And then if we color it and highlight it um, and overlay LIDAR with it, we can really make that lava flow pop out and it can help us visualize what these events look like um, for these different volcanoes. Um, this is a oblique image of Mount Rainier with LIDAR imagery and satellite imagery superimposed on one another. And here the purple and yellow colors are the Lahar Paths or the Lahar Hazard Zones um, for Mount Rainier. And you can see really the, the extent of those and how there's um, towns and different homesteads that are within this river valley within the Lahar Hazard Zone. This um, on the left, this is a picture, uh, aerial photo of lava flows in Skamania County. And on the right, these are lava flows at Mount St. Helens. And then if we do some creative cartography um, for the Skamania County lava flows, we can really start to pull out different lava flow events um, using this LIDAR data. Wes and John both talked about, in addition to the stratovolcanoes, we have lots of smaller volcanoes in Washington, what we call cinder cones. And this is a LIDAR image of a cinder cone in um, the big lava bed area in Skamania County. And this is a LIDAR image of Tum Tum Mountain, another um, smaller volcano in Clark County. In addition to volcanic features, we can also use LIDAR to look at glaciers. So this is an aerial image of Mount Rainier. And then if we use LIDAR to pull out the glaciers, we can really get a cool visual of what those glaciers look like on Mount Rainier. And so LIDAR is this incredible tool and we are the keepers of the LIDAR for Washington State. And so we have what's called a LIDAR portal. You can, the website is on the bottom or again, you can just search LIDAR Washington and it should be the first thing that comes up. And you can navigate around and check out all the different um, Hillshade data, download it, save it, um, or just view it uh, for any area that you are interested in. And in addition to our LIDAR portal, we have a geology portal where you can find out about geologic hazards, um, volcanoes, tsunamis, earthquakes, geothermal resources, hot springs, you name it. If it's geology related, we have it on our portal. Um, and so you can type in your address in the top or an area that you're interested in and it can tell you and you can turn on and off the layers and learn about different geologic hazards. The map I'm showing here is the USGS data for volcanic hazards. So these are the maps um, that John and Wes were showing where we have the different volcanoes, the Lahar hazard area, the close to the volcano hazard zones and then on top of it are all the different volcanic vents or smaller volcanoes that are also um, in Washington state. And so just in summary, we've got lots of great information about preparedness, um, geologic information portal, we've got hazard booklets. We also, I didn't talk about this today, but we've got roadside geology books about Mount Rainier and Mount St. Helens. We've got cool LIDAR, LIDAR art, and geotourism. So please check out our resources and feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kirsten Hoffman. I'm the emergency manager with the city of Puyallup. Okay, excellent. So I am very excited to be a part of this webinar today to present on a volcanic Lahar evacuation exercise that the city of Puyallup 
did in collaboration with the Puyallup School District in May 2019. Um, uh, it's really exciting to have hear, heard from the previous speakers today. As an emergency manager for a local jurisdiction, uh, I rely heavily on experts um, from the USGS, from the DNR, from Washington State Emergency Management Division to really inform our preparedness efforts at the local level. Um, and it's truly a partnership um, from all of those different, uh, from all those different agencies, organizations that um, at my level as a city emergency manager help to um, move us forward in a constant state of preparedness for different emergencies um, that, uh, that, that we face in the city of Puyallup. In the city of Puyallup, uh, we uh, refer to Mount Rainier as our volcano. Um, and it um, uh, has a number of hazards that we uh, continually are working on planning how we can mitigate impacts from those uh, hazards and work with our community and our residents um, to really be prepared for any of those uh, hazards that Mount Rainier can um, throw at us as, as Wes was talking about in his presentation. Um, so this volcanic lahar evacuation exercise uh, was made possible because of many partners. I'm going to talk about some of the partners in my presentation, um, but there's there's there, there's many that I won't have time to mention. So I just wanted to um, um, share that. Oops. Okay. So again, my name is Kirsten Hoffman. I'm the emergency manager for the city of Puyallup. And for this exercise, I served as the uh, primary exercise planner for the planning team, as well as the planning section chief. Uh, in emergency management, we use something called the incident command system for emergency response. And there's different positions that are, are, are used for response activities. And one of those is the planning section chief. And what was really helpful about working with, uh, with, with, with both of those roles was that I was really able to become intimately familiar with the plan for this exercise um, and then also um, ensure that along the way we were meeting all of our uh, exercise objectives. The number one objective for this exercise was safety. Um, safety of all the participants uh, in the exercise, all the students, all of the staff, all of the first responders, um, all of the different partners who were part of this exercise. And it's through that safety lens that we do all of our planning and all of our preparations and all of our training for an exercise of this of this size. Um, the additional objectives for this exercise uh, were that everybody was going to participate. So all of the schools in the Lahar zone participating in this exercise, all of the students, all of the staff, all of the teachers, we wanted to ensure that everybody had a chance to participate and practice their Lahar evacuation route. Um, and then another objective was accountability. So ensuring throughout uh, participation in the exercise, accountability of all of the folks involved. So I'm going to show a video. This is a video that's available on the City of Puyallup website if anybody wants to view it at a later time. And we were really fortunate to have Pierce County TV uh, on site at our City Emergency Operations Center while we were doing this exercise and then also in the field and it captured a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, successes of this exercise and has now uh, left us um, a way I think to really uh, share uh, what this exercise meant to us as a as a community. We live in a volcanic risk area. Mount Rainier is a beautiful mountain. When it's out, we love it, but there's a lot of risk that comes with it. There's the potential for a no-notice lahar. Lahar is a mudslide that can come off of the mountain. Safety and security is really important to all of us in the Puyallup School District. Each of the schools regularly practices fire drills. And each year, we also practice a lahar drill. We've got about 20 schools evacuating, a total of 8,000 students. This is the first time we've come together in this large of a partnered effort. 
Puyallup EOC. This is the Puyallup Emergency Operations Center. The Emergency Operations Center's job today is to support field personnel who are walking with students to evacuation points. Our job is to make sure that all the pieces of the puzzle today are coming together. The planning process for an Alahar evacuation drill of this magnitude has been occurring for months and months and months. It's through that planning process we get to know each other. We develop relationships. We develop partnerships. Yes, we do. From police to public works, the school district, fire, dispatch, communications, parks and recreation, city government. It's really an incredible list of partners and agencies and jurisdictions that come together. A really good place to check information is the City of Puyallup website. We have an emergency management section on the website with information not only about this evacuation, but other preparedness info as well. Preparedness for us is key. We we can't do everything as a police department, so we really count on citizens to be prepared to know the Lahar evacuation routes out of the city. If those sirens go off, you have to evacuate to higher ground and get to safety. In the event that this is a real emergency, the parents are going to want to get to their students as quickly as they can. So this is an opportunity for families to talk about, okay, if this has happened, this is what you're going to do. There's so many good pieces of information that you can talk about as a family, particularly if you're living in the valley floor, that would really help in a real life emergency. Preparedness absolutely counts. The plan went off exactly as we hoped it would. If this actually happens, kids are safer. Kids and teachers and staff members know how they're supposed to evacuate in the event of a Lahar. The fact that Puyallup is more prepared is just a gift for our community. We were fortunate to be able to mobilize several drone teams during the exercise. So not only did that give us uh, footage to be able to use in our after action for future improvement, but it also gave us uh, real eyes on the ground from the emergency operations center during the exercise which was really helpful when we were actually moving all of the uh, schools to their evacuation um, locations during the exercise. So briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the exercise background and planning process. Um, this exercise built on previous individual school evacuation drills, uh, including some of the success of our neighbors, the uh, City of Ording, uh, Ording School District, Ording Valley Fire and Rescue, Ording Police Department. Uh, was very, very generous in working with us to share some of their best practices. Uh, we also have had schools in the Puyallup School District participate in Lahar evacuation exercises as well. Uh, this was the first time that we did um, such, a, such a comprehensive effort in uh, moving all of the um, schools and staff, teachers, um, students at the same time. So we spent a lot of time reviewing the school Lahar evacuation plans the school evacuation routes, destination locations, and revising as needed to get ready for this exercise. Um, this exercise took about a year and a half to plan. Uh, we uh, started part of that planning process in the fall of uh, 2018. We held a tabletop exercise, uh, which is uh, an exercise that is a low stress um, exercise where you typically have a number of objectives and then a scenario, and then working with a facilitator, you you walk through that and that's incredibly helpful to determine areas that you need to improve upon uh, for uh, future trainings or exercises or emergency management planning. Uh, really critical was the commitment from all the participating partners um, and we absolutely could not have uh, succeeded with this exercise if we hadn't had those partners really engaged from the beginning of the planning process. These are some of the members of the planning team uh, up in the um, top picture. Fire Chief Zane Gibson of Ording Valley Fire and Rescue and Mike Hamilton, who is a emergency management GIS, Geographic Information Systems Specialist. Um, below, uh, Shar Krause, who's the Director of Safety and Student Services for Puyallup School District. Next to her is School Resource Officer Mark Ketter, and that's Mike Hamilton to their right. We spent many, many uh, sessions and meetings working on maps, redoing maps, re-driving re, re evacuation routes, walking evacuation routes, really getting back to that primary objective of safety for this exercise and ensuring that all of the students, staff and faculty uh, who were participating were going to be able to safely get to their evacuation location. This is a picture uh, from a tabletop exercise that we held for Puyallup School District administrators, principals and vice principals. 
um, a facilitated discussion about their school Lahar evacuation uh, plans, routes, and how they would proceed. And again, this was really valuable for us to get ready uh, for the full scale exercise. And this is such a great environment to have these kinds of conversations because it's low stress and you can take the time to talk through a scenario to identify the areas that need to be uh, improved upon or reworked to get ready for a larger exercise. For this exercise, over 20 Puyallup School District schools and district buildings participated. We also had four private schools uh, that participated. They're located in the Lahar evacuation zone. The Puyallup City Hall, the Puyallup Police Department staff also participated. Uh, what this meant was that we had a lot of planning meetings to get ready for an exercise of this scale. Uh, averaged about three planning meetings leading up to the exercise which e with each of those facilities, uh, which means that there's uh, a lot of planning meetings that, um, that, that, that have to be accomplished. We were strategic and tried to work with the schools and the different facilities to build on to existing plan planning meetings that they had or existing uh, meetings that they had of their administrators or their staff so we could really take advantage of their time and not add too much um, to workloads that are already pretty busy. Um, I mentioned earlier that one of our objectives was that all students and staff were going to participate and that meant that we partnered with Access and Functional Needs Planning staff from Pierce County Department of Emergency Management to work with us to identify any schools uh, that might have some student staff or teachers who needed some planning with um, support so they could successfully participate in the exercise as well. Part of the planning process, like I mentioned before, was lots of planning meetings leading up to the exercise. It was really critical that we have a communication plan so that we could communicate with the schools real time while they were participating in the evacuation exercise. So we spent a number of uh, sessions leading up to the exercise, going to the different schools, uh, training them on how to use radios, practicing with the radios, and we ultimately ended up writing scripts that were specific to the staff who were assigned radios because we wanted to hear very specific check-ins from them day on, uh, day of the exercise. So we wanted to know when they began their evacuation, uh, when they were en route, when they reached their evacuation location, when they were returning back to school, and when they had all returned back to school and had completed the exercise. And when you have over 20 schools participating, it's a lot of communication that you have uh, coming from the field. So this was a really important component of our planning process. Again, the map revisions, the route confirmations, this was on, ongoing that year leading up to the exercise, really ensuring that the, uh, that the schools and all of the exercise participants were familiar with those routes and comfortable with them. So the day of the exercise, it wasn't anything new. They had had a chance to really be prepared for that. We also did a number of briefings leading up to the exercise. Uh, we briefed groups of school resource officers. So one of our planning team members, Officer Mark Ketter, reached out to neighboring jurisdictions to engage their school resource officers to assist us with the exercise. So we were able to assign a school resource officer to each of the uh, schools to support them through the exercise. We also briefed our public work staff, our city, uh, city Puyallup public work staff were an incredible asset during this exercise and they were out in the field uh, day of uh, supporting the people participating. Also briefings with the police department, uh, partner briefings, briefings with the school district, uh, briefings with um, neighboring health organizations. Anybody who had questions about the exercise, uh, we really wanted to make sure that they were, uh, that they had an understanding of what we were doing with the exercise and were ready to support us and also bring them back to that primary objective, which was safety and ensuring that all of the students, staff and teachers who were participating in this exercise were going to be able to do so um, safely. And then finally, incident action plan meetings and briefings. So we put together a full incident action plan for this exercise and we did, we did activate the City QLP Emergency Operations Center to support it as well. One uh, really important tool that we developed to support the exercise is this dashboard. This is a GIS, Geographic Information System dashboard. Uh, these are typically highly customizable based on the incident that um, you are responding to, or in this case, the exercise that you're planning on. And what was really helpful with this is that it allowed people 
who were not in the City of Puyallup Emergency Operations Center or in the field participating uh, for people in other locations to be able to watch uh, our progress throughout the course of the exercise on that day. And we had uh, staff in the Puyallup Emergency Operations Center whose job it was to keep this uh, dashboard updated so that real time our stakeholders in other locations could see the progress of the exercise. This is our primary master map from the exercise. We had a very large printout of this up in the Emergency Operations Center, and it proved to just be an incredible uh, tool for us day of. And on it, it has all the participating schools and facilities, as well as a head count. Um, it has all of the routes. It has the evacuation locations. It has the locations of drone teams, of our public work staff, of our police department staff, of our ham radios. Um, it just really uh, was an incredible resource to have um, this ready and use this during the exercise. It's actually something that's still up in our EOC and that we still uh, that we still refer to. I mentioned that we put together a full incident action plan. Um, within that incident action plan, we had what's called uh, an ICS incident command system 204 for every participating school and facility. And this was really important because each school or facility had their own plan and their own unique needs that needed to be addressed to participate in this exercise. And we spent a lot of time working with uh, each school to ensure that they had a plan that met their needs so that they could safely participate in the exercise. On the right, we had a, a quick guide uh, to all of the participating schools and what their uh, what their teachers and staff administrators would be wearing uh, so that uh, folks, uh, first responders and folks in the field could quickly recognize the exercise participants. Just a couple of photos from the day of the exercise. This is a photo from the Washington State Fairgrounds. This is one of the evacuation locations for some of the participating schools. And then each of those evacuation locations, we had signage so that the schools knew they had made it to their location and that that's where they were supposed to regroup, uh, do their accountability, and then prepare to head back to their school. And the photo on the inset is one of the principals from the elementary school uh, with his map going uh, through um, all of the folks from his school doing the accountability check. Lots of lessons learned from this exercise. Uh, some of the key ones were to really make sure that commitments are in place for the planning process. Much of the work is done the, uh, during the planning process um, leading up to the exercise to make sure it's successful. And then planning well in advance, especially when you're working with uh, busy, busy schools and school districts, you have to make sure you can get on folks calendars well in advance to reserve that time. Uh, bring in partners as early as possible. Plan for opportunities to meet with all of your participating um, partners. Uh, really plan for your exercise communications, uh, including time for training and really time for training for any other things that are going to be a part of the exercise. And then using the planning process, uh, it's the same planning process we use for emergency response. So using that planning process for trainings and exercises is a really great uh, learning lesson for everybody involved. So today we were uh, practicing how we would evacuate the school and get to higher ground in the case that Mount Rainier uh, were to erupt and uh, Lahar flow was headed this way. I am told this uh, exercise was the largest uh, volcanic exercise in North America. Um, we evacuated between seven and 8,000. Today at school, we had the whole school come and uh, walk this route. And um, we just got to here, and then once we get to the fairgrounds, we did our uh, roll call. We gathered the school together to make sure everyone's here. And uh, if, it, if in the real case of uh, the Wahar, we walk up the hill out of the valley in order to avoid the Wahar. So today was a success because of all of the hard work of many people and our principals and staff and students did an excellent job ahead of time preparing for this day. And there were so many partner agencies that helped us get ready for this day. 
probably too many to name, but I want to highlight a few that really stand out. Certainly the City of Puyallup Emergency Management Division, Puyallup Police Department, Central Pierce Fire, um, the Pierce County Incident Management Team had some folks supporting us, uh, Pierce County Department of Emergency Management, and a special shout out to our Puyallup School District School Resource Officers, Officer uh, Ketter, um, who really were on the ground making sure everyone was stay safe, knew what to do, um, a lot of moving parts and a lot of people made it happen. On, on behalf of the Puyallup School District staff and students, we owe a big thank you to our partner agencies. It was a team effort and we could not have done it without you. So next steps in our preparedness continuum and our constant work to stay prepared, we will be looking at doing a full scale HAR evacuation exercise in the spring of 2022. This time expanding that footprint to include other school districts and jurisdictions that also are in the Lahar evacuation zone. Our neighbors, including Puyallup, Ording, Sumner, Bonnie Lake, and we actually have uh, started planning this exercise for next spring and we're really looking forward to the continued partnership um, of the many, many people who make these exercises possible and are very thankful for this opportunity to share um, a little bit about this exercise. My Email and phone number is here, and please feel free to reach out to me with any uh, questions or anything I can ever share about this exercise. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hello, this is Brian Terbush again from Washington State Emergency Management Division. Thanks to everyone so far. You have learned a little bit about how we know that our volcanoes are active, how we'll know when they start showing signs of eruption, what we're doing to get ready for that, how you can learn what the hazards are in your area, and what some of your communities have been doing uh, in order to help get more prepared. And thanks to all the presenters for that so far. I'm gonna bring it back around right to you and we're gonna talk about um, what you can do to be prepared for these kind of unpredictable but huge events potentially or potentially small. All right, so what I want you to take away from this first is if one of our five main active volcanoes in Washington erupts, you will be impacted in some way. Now it could just be something very small. Um, like, for example, in 1975, when Mount Baker was erupting, all we got was a lot of media attention. Um, there were some closures as well, but um, that was a huge part of it. Again, Mount St. Helens 2004, we get a huge amount of media attention. Um, international news from Japan and other countries parking there at Johnston Ridge Observatory to wait for this celebrity volcano to erupt. Um, that's kind of the status it had after 1980. Um, if this happens in our state, you will know about it and you will not be able to stop hearing about it on the news probably for a month or more. Um, let's go to more medium impacts, closures, things like that. You can actually, um, this will impact things like the economy, um, especially because there's uncertain timelines of volcanic eruptions. I'll go into in a second, but um, evacuation planning being done in communities, um, just everybody starting to solidify those events in their head, um, closing national forests and national parks, Campgrounds at Mount Baker were closed in 1975 because they were potentially in the Lahar hazard zone. Um, and then you have the same situation that we've seen a little bit recently where um, people are kind of pushing back against some of the scientists who are saying, hey, this is dangerous. We need to make sure that we're safe right now, um, but we should open everything up. And then five days later, this was 40 years ago today, actually, um, Mount St. Helens erupted five days after everybody was pushing to open it again. Um, these have uncertain timelines, but the experts are the best we have when it comes to these eruptions. Then finally, you've seen a lot of these pictures before, but from 1980, you can see a lot of the actual damage that happens. Um, think of these as high impact events. Um, we hope it doesn't come to this in any eruption. We always hope it's smaller, but we need to be prepared for these. Um, a lot of homes were damaged, at least 27 bridges in this eruption. Um, so when you think about impacts, think about if you have to commute over any of those bridges, uh, that will impact you a lot. So um, one thing we wanna talk about quickly is how will you know when a volcano is going to erupt? Where do you get that information? Well, the United States Geological Survey has the Volcano Notification Service. 
Um, and we've put right here on our mil.wa.gov slash alerts page um, a link to that because I'm also going to direct you there for uh, your local emergency management and other ways to get alerts. Um, so just giving you one site for consolidation here. Um, but all of our volcanoes are at background activity right now. Um, that just means that while they're having all those earthquakes that Wes and John were talking about, that's normal for these volcanoes. Now, if they start having a lot more earthquakes, um, the activity may be raised to advisory. Basically, that means it's going into this period of unrest. It might be moving towards eruption, but it might not. Um, basically, these are just codes that help you, um, similar to weather when you get flood watches, flood warnings. Um, this helps you get a better idea of where the volcano is activity wise. Um, so if it's in a watch phase, it's kind of exhibiting that heightened unrest. It might erupt any time. Um, and if it's in a warning, it might be erupting already. Uh, that's kind of how it works. So any of these levels, um, the local jurisdictions are going to be making decisions about are things being closed? Um, and uh, these are about safety. Also, volcanoes are a little interesting with this. I mentioned the uncertain timelines. Floods can be easy because you get a few day forecast. We're going to get an atmospheric river. Um, here's a flood warning. Uh, earthquakes, a couple seconds of warning. Uh, wildfires, you get that spark. Um, but then you can think about the duration of these events. Your flooding is going to last maybe a few days. Uh, the damage will last longer, but um, hurricanes, a few days. You might get aftershocks for months, um, possibly even years for an earthquake. That wildfire might last a month or so. When we get to eruptions, it can be really confusing and it can be very stressful because Sometimes that lead up takes months. Sometimes it even takes years. Um, other times, like in 2004, it just started showing that unrest in Mount St. Helens. And uh, only in about a few days, it started <laughs> to uh, erupt out that lava dome. Um, but it took a couple months in 1980. It wasn't an immediate thing. So during all that lead up time, uh, emergency managers like Kirsten has to make decisions about their jurisdiction. Um, without having all the information. So we have this picture here. You get that kind of incomplete picture. You know something might happen, but you have to make decisions based on that incomplete picture. So this is where that preparedness is going to come in handy. Um, with all that uncertainty, what can you actually do? Well, we have a way to try to make it simplified in a way that's going to make it um, able, something everyone can understand for every hazard. Learn your hazards, build kits, make plans. So just three steps, that's all. Go into a little more detail here to figure it out. Um, so learning your hazards is going to be this first step here. Uh, we've seen these hazard maps again um, and lots of these. All of our volcanoes have them and you can use Washington Geological Survey's geology portal for that interactive map. Type in your address and take a look at them. Um, know what to expect and everybody should give themselves a round of applause for this step because you are here. You are learning your hazards right now and what you can expect as well as how you can get information. Um, but learn about those impacts they can have shelter in place. So I've got a pretty unsinkable clue for how to uh, how to figure out this map here if you didn't get it before. Think of these hazards in the pink as near um, your pyroclastic flows. Um, think of these ones in the warm colors as lahar. Uh, but then you have ash hazard, which John was talking about before, um, which really any way the wind blows. So you have near lahar wherever you are. Um, these things can happen. So. Know about where your hazards are and which ones you might experience in uh, different areas. And then what's important is how do you protect yourself from these? If it's a lahar, the only safe thing you can do is evacuate. You don't want to be there when a lahar arrives. If it's ash, very heavy ash fall, you might end up sheltering in place for a while. So the other part of learn your hazards that's very important is know where to receive reliable information. So here's that mil.wa.gov slash alerts again. Um, this is your key to signing up for that volcano notification service. Um, this is also going to have links at the bottom to your local emergency management and to their social media accounts, which often post useful information uh, about hazards. So with your local emergency management, they have hazards that are specific to your area. At the state, we're going to try, um, but it's not going to be quite as specific unless it's something like an earthquake that impacts the whole state. Um, so please connect with your local emergency management um, and sign up for their alerts if they have them. They might even tell you about traffic or something, um, but ultimately it's going to be relevant to you where you are. Okay. They can also share specific preparedness information on your area. Um, a quick slide on volcano safety, but for the sake of time, uh, I will just cover if an area is closed, like we mentioned before, a lot of these are in national parks, national forest land. 
if it's closed, it is for your safety. And we've tried to explain this whole situation where um, those pyroclastic flows, those volcanic bombs, ballistics, they're very unpredictable, um, but they're also very, very challenging to survive, um, very unlikely. So with that kind of unpredictability, if these areas are closed, it's for your safety, please stay out of them. Make that informed decision. Okay, second step. We did know your hazards, let's make plans. Think about evacuation and reunification. We just saw an excellent example from Kirsten of what a whole community can do um, when all their schools do evacuation plans. Now, after all those schools evacuate and the students go up to those high ground locations from Lahar, how do you reunify with them? Um, fortunately, uh, just a whole bunch of adults showing up and trying to pick up kids is not something that schools look highly upon. So if you have kids in school, please make sure that you connect with the school and find out what their unif reunification plan is. Um, but think about things like where will you meet? Are these different plans for home, for work, for school, things like that? Um, again, your local emergency management is going to be a huge boon for this. They might even have tools like maps. Um, they might even have where the assembly areas are listed um, can show you which way to evacuate. Um, another part of it is your family communication plan or maybe with your friends. Who are you going to call? But please text, don't call. Um, save that bandwidth on the uh, 911 circuits for the folks who are going to need to be using that for uh, first response, your firefighters, your uh, other first responders. So, um, but think about having an out of area contact, someone who's out of the area, you can text and say, I'm safe. Um, let them know that's their role, uh, so they're not surprised by that. And then uh, if everybody sends them that message, they can pass on everybody that's safe back there. We have more about this on our uh, mil.wa.gov slash preparedness. I'll post soon. Um, ultimately to write down the numbers though, part of this preparedness is you might be in a situation where you don't have power um, and can't rely on your phone having these. So I've got some handy tools on mil.wa.gov slash preparedness where you can write these all down and keep them together. Um, finally saying here, build kits. Um, and yes, that's plural. Um, while you're getting together materials for an emergency, think about who depends on you whether it's other family members, whether you have any neighbors that need help. Um, think about your pets. They don't want you to forget about them and you don't want to forget about them either. They'll let you know. Um, but think about when you're putting together two weeks of supplies. We want you to be two weeks ready in Washington. It may be different in your local area, but this is just kind of our general um, things you may want to have. Water is pretty important. Um, Non-perishable food as well, but things that you might forget are like your, your comfort items. Um, Disasters are stressful situations. So if you have something that keeps you sane and comfortable, that's that's very important to have with you in a disaster situation. So we've got some good tools for this. Um, don't forget about those with your pets. Also think about your daily needs, things you might need. Medications, if you take those, you wanna have those stored for an emergency. Um, reading glasses, if you use them, that could make an emergency very difficult. Um, and then I guess it's not every day, but um, important documentation, things like your insurance information, medical vaccination records. Um, also kits is plural. Um, sorry to make it complicated. Um, as we're talking about this preparedness is, we can make this very easy. And every time you go to the grocery store, we recommend picking up one non-perishable item. Um, that's kind of easy mode. Um, pick up an extra container of water. But if you do that, you find that you will have, you will be significantly more prepared than you were before, just having some extra things in your pantry. And it's not too much to ask that time. A can of food doesn't cost very much. Um, I know it can be challenging for some, but try it at that lower level, maybe every other trip to the grocery store. Everything you do has you more prepared than before. Um, preparedness is not going to the grocery store once and picking up that looks like about 50 rolls of toilet paper just for you and uh, insane amounts of lotion um, or gasoline if you're watching the news right now. Um, no, that does not help anyone but you. Um, if you do it by this little by little situation, make sure you have what you need. Um, it's going to help everybody, including yourself, and be a lot less stressful. Um, so when we talk about a grab and go kit, Think about two to three days. Now, this is your situation where a lahar is coming to your house. You get your alert that it's coming and you evacuate. You grab that grab and go kit and take off. Uh, two weeks ready is going to be what's in your home. So uh, in case you have to shelter in place, you have those things available. Um, so a little bit of a difference between the kits and when you'd use them. But if you live in a lahar evacuation zone, that's going to be when you want to have this um, lahar uh, grab and go kit. 
also makes sense if you travel to the coast and uh, you might be in a tsunami zone. Um, other hazards, preparing for one helps you prepare for all of them. We can also think of preparedness as a continuum. Again, that if you pick up one can of food, you are slightly better than you were, and maybe your beard has grown a little, but everybody is somewhere on this, um, on this continuum. Maybe you have three days of supplies, maybe you got two weeks, but this is not, um, you, you're not just prepared at that point. Um, you have to rotate and restock, rinse and repeat, however you want to put it. Um, every six months or so, you're supposed to change your smoke detector batteries. That's a great time to go through and get make sure that none of your food is expired. Um, maybe have a perishable or a non-perishable um, banquet at your home or something like that. Um, in order to make preparedness as simple as possible, can throw in a plug at mill.wa.gov slash personal for our prepare in a year program. The idea is um, made a little brochure that takes some steps. You put in about an hour or two hours a month, and at the end of the year, you are much better off than you were before as far as preparedness. Um, so ultimately to wrap this up, what should you expect when you're expecting a volcano, volcanic eruption in Washington? There are going to be a lot of dedicated people. You've only seen some of them um, today, but they will be monitoring the situation, doing their best to share information with you in every media possible um, and to lessen the impacts, make everything safer for you. Um, all the people that are here today, we can thank them for helping plan for this, um, for monitoring our volcanoes and uh, helping us just be more ready for this. But for each of those situations, every step that you take to be more prepared will help them to help you. Um, in a situation like a large disaster, first responders will be coming for you, but you and your neighbors, the people around you, are the first ones on the scene. And if you can help yourselves, that's gonna make it so much easier to help everyone. Um, so even just a little bit. Um, so huge thanks to everybody who's been here. I know we have gone a little bit over, <laughs> so we will try to answer a couple of questions in the chat, but wanted to throw a couple of links up there. Um, again, that mill.wa.gov slash alerts is huge, and our geology portal at dnr.wa.gov um, is where you can find those interactive maps. So thank you, and I will quickly jump over to the questions to see what we have. If we have... Uh, one I can see right now is, will there be similar presentations in the future? Where would we find notices? Well, again, if you connect with your local emergency management, we try to let them know about all this stuff so that they can share events like this that are for your awareness. But also our EMD Prepare YouTube channel. If you subscribe there anytime one of these uh, presentations is posted, we do have an earthquake and tsunami webinar up there as well. Um, so you can look at those. Um, Oh, so this is one for uh, possibly John or Wes. Are we aware of any other Washington volcanoes having programs like the Mount St. Helens Institute's Volcano Naturalist Program? Hi, this is John. Um, no, <laughs> I think the naturalist program that the uh, Mount St. Helens Institute runs is unique in the state. There's a lot of unique things about Mount St. Helens in the state from its shape to uh, you know, other things like that. OK, so the one we have here is a is there a specific air purifier we would recommend for volcanic ash or a specific type of filter rating? Um, they have one for wildfire smoke that's helped a lot last year and was more effective than a standard air purifier filter. Does anyone have any uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, any air filter that's rated as a HEPA, H-E-P-A filter, um, will take the fine particulate matter out of the air, but you need to be sure that you're not asking the filter to um, filter more air volume than it's capable of handling. So you'll find a rating on the air cleaner for uh, basically room sizes. And I, I think most of the commonly available HEPA uh, air filters, you know, will handle, you know, a, a living room, you know, 400 square feet sort of thing or a, or a bedroom. And so you would want to just be sure that you're sizing the air filter that you have, the HEPA air filter to the volume of space so that you're not overloading it and which would make it not as effective. 
Thank you. So that's all we had for the questions here. We tried to answer them in the live Q&A as it went, um, but I wanted to let you know once we post the video, if you didn't catch um, any email emails on there, you are welcome to send emails to uh, with your questions to the folks who put them up here um, on the presentation. So please check those out. Um, again, EMD Prepare is our YouTube channel. I think that's posted in the published as well, um, but wanted to thank everyone for your time. Um, one additional event we will have coming up next week. If you have any additional questions, we'll be on Reddit for an Ask Me Anything event. Um, so slash I R I M A. Um, so yeah, that can be the place where you can ask any questions. For example, if you had to say, is Mount Rainier going to blow in the next 10 years? I would say I'm not, <laughs> I'm not certain. I'm, there's a lot of uncertainty about volcanoes. Um, if it shows signs of unrest, it might. Um, Wes or John? One more question came up, sorry. Yeah, 10 years is a long time. Um, in my experience, in the experience of the volcanological, volcanological community, you know, what we've seen is that long dormant volcanoes um, take a little bit of time to get up from a cold start to full on eruption. So for instance, Mount St. Helens took about two months. It had been dormant for 123 years. Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines had a, a very large eruption and that took about uh, 10 weeks. So saying, um, you know, when you get out to 10 years or more or time frames like that, you know, you really can't say. Um, in the absence of there being any unusual activity that we would call unrest, um, basically um, all the cascades are, you know, a small probability of an eruption in, in any given year, uh, but they're all about equal. So, um, yeah, you, you, you kind of have to wait until you start to see signs that there's unusual activity is that an unusual activity is occurring, and that's why we feel like it's really important to have uh, good monitoring in place at these volcanoes as uh, far ahead of time as possible. Um, you don't want to be playing catch up with one of these very large, powerful and capricious natural systems. Thank you for that. So we really couldn't say is, is the answer, but it's continuing. We're continuing to add monitoring stations to it just in case. That's why we watch everything closely as we can. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, would an eruption put off loud noise to act as an alert? We're getting more questions now. <laughs> so I, I can answer that. Um, yes, an eruption that uh, moves ash into the air causes sound. Uh, one thing that we actually have out there uh, on the volcano now, which is uh, fairly new for us in the last five years, is infrasound, which is really low frequency sound waves. So we can track those low frequency sound waves, which volcanoes do a really good, uh, they, they love to generate infrasound, be it from avalanches, uh, landslides, debris flows, or eruptions. And so uh, part of our uh, Lahar monitoring strategy at Rainier is actually to use these infrasound sensors, and so they are there at Rainier for that task. But they'll they will record anything that generates infrasound, and that includes an eruption um, from uh, Rainier or any other volcano for that matter. Um, if we have something in the near field being, you know, a few miles away from the volcano. So that'll be the eruption itself, um, but the lead up to the eruption again, it might be a couple days, might be a couple months. Because these are well monitored volcanoes, we don't anticipate an eruption will happen without warning. Um, at least that's that's the expectation because they're well monitored. Uh, that magma has got to move and it's going to be detected. Um, so yes, if there's a loud explosion, that will be enough warning that an explosion is happening. But um, ideally keep that uh, volcano notification service about your local volcano updated. OK, um, I think for that looks like the end of questions for now. Please come to our Reddit if you have any more. Ask me anything and uh, thank you all for your time. We will close the event now. <laughs>